The Spirit and the church cry out, Come, Lord Jesus. As we gather this third Sunday in the season of Advent, the season of preparation and repentance, as we look forward to the coming of our Savior Jesus, the third week in Advent, you'll notice we light the, the rose-colored or pink candle. We've got the decorations, the chrismans on the tree. It is the Sunday of joy, Gaudet in Latin. Um, this third week in Advent, we focus on the joy that comes from knowing God and being known by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And today we're going to talk about our source of joy. And even though nowadays it might seem kind of hard to feel joy and experience joy and uh, to really rejoice this Christmas season, we'll talk about where our joy comes from here as God's children. Today we do have Holy Communion in our worship service. Uh, you should have picked up a, a prepackaged communion uh, cup as you came into the sanctuary. If you did not, the elders are still in the back there. Um, just go ahead and seek your way back there to get a communion cup from one of the elders. Um, just a reminder how that will work. Um, at the end, towards the end of the service, when we get to the service of the sacrament, um, I'll have the words of institution. Don't open your cup quite yet, but I'll have you at that time have your cup uh, at the ready. And you just hold it up as we have the words of institution. And then when it's time to receive communion, I will then invite you specifically to remove the paper and take the wafer, turn the cup over, move the paper, and take the wine. So wait until you get those instructions before we um, open up our communion materials. And if you open them too early, uh, you know what? The Word of God is present. Um, I haven't seen a lightning bolt come through the church walls yet on this process. I think our Lord understands that we're doing the best we can. All right? So... Um, that's our communion process today. Um, if you want it right now, you know, the hymnal racks aren't being used. You just kind of tuck that in the hymnal rack and hide it away until it's time um, then. Uh, we have masks at this service, but once you're seated here in the sanctuary and you are six feet away from anybody you don't live with, um, if you would like to remove your mask for our worship, you may. If you want to keep it on, that's fine. But I do ask if you get up to use the restroom, and of course when church is over this morning, to put your masks on before you move around the sanctuary. All right, I think that's all of my pre-service announcements. We'll begin with the invocation. Please rise. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we gather today for worship in the name of our triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
God's beloved, let us come before God our Father with repentant hearts and confess our sins to him, asking in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that he grant forgiveness to us. For God's word says, comfort, comfort my people. Their warfare is ended, their sin has been forgiven. Together we confess, God of mercy, I know that I am sinful by nature. I sin against you in what I think, say, and do, in ways that I know and in ways of which I am unaware. I lack joy because it is difficult to trust God in the midst of many trials. My focus is myself and not my God or my neighbor. I ask for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, to forgive me for this and for all the ways in which I've done wrong against you. Upon hearing your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. By the command of Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Yeah. 
Lord be with you. Let us pray together the collect of the day. Lord Jesus Christ, we implore you to hear our prayers and to lighten the darkness of our hearts by your gracious visitation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the third Sunday in Advent is from Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, oil of gladness instead of mourning, garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that they may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations." For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them. They are an offspring the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks to all, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please rise for the gospel reading? Our gospel reading comes from John chapter 1. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed, and he did not deny. He confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. In response to having heard God's word read, 
Let us join together in professing our Christian faith today with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures and he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Here ends our text. Grace, mercy, and peace from our God and Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Most likely to end up in prison. Did your high school do the uh, voting at the end of their senior year for the seniors for the yearbook? You know, most likely to succeed, most likely to be president, most likely to end up in prison. Was that anybody in high school that had those kind of votes? Most likely to end up in prison as voted by my fellow classmates senior year of high school. What did they know that you don't? Also voted most likely to teach at my high school. How do those two go together? Well, Growing up in small town, Taylorville, Illinois, population um, just under 11,000, right? That's a small town in Illinois. We ruled, you know, yeah, we had a Casey's and yeah, we had a Walmart, which are kind of the two things I use now to determine whether or not something's a small town. But um, we considered ourselves a small town because there was only one public high school in town. So that made you a small town by Illinois standards. And so small town, rural Illinois... And growing up there, it was almost like the world ended about two miles up I, or Highway 29, which was you know, about as far as you could see up that highway. And you go to the other side of town and up, up Highway 104, about two miles. And you go to the south side of town, Highway 51, about two miles. And that's where the world ended. Kind of how it usually is in small towns, right? The world is kind of, it, it, it ends once you get a couple miles outside of, outside of here. There's just not much out there. And as you grow up in that small town, you really, you don't care what's out there, what's beyond what you can see. Oh, yeah, sure. And I was a kid, once a year, Grandma and Grandpa would take us down to St. Louis to watch the world's best baseball team play baseball. 
And then, yeah, maybe once or twice, we'd go up to Chicago where they also play something like baseball. And we'd go to museums and concerts and musicals. And, but then we'd always come back and, you know, it just didn't matter what was outside of that town. Then you kind of grow up and went off to college and I went to Charleston, Illinois. That's actually it was a smaller town if you take away the college population. And then I went to Concordia University, Chicago. I had spent a couple of summers in, as an intern in Chicago, and now I went to school there for three years. Much different experience than my little town of 10, 11,000 people. Much different experience taking a train to a, a seminar or even for a class, hopping on the L or going downtown. Much different experience. And then we ended up living in St. Louis for seminary for three years. And then we're living there, and we're in just outside of Forest Park. We're in Clayton. There is a subway station, not the restaurant, a place where a train goes underground. There was a subway station a block from our apartment, a block and a half from our apartment. That's a totally different way of life, a totally different kind of animal. And then God said, you're going to go live in the middle of a cornfield in rural Nebraska and be a pastor there. And that was amazing. You couldn't find it on the GPS. The GPS thought we lived in the middle of the cornfield, literally. That was amazing. Great, wonderful ministry. We've loved ministry in Nebraska. People here are so nice, usually speaking. My hometown had a sign outside. Of, it was my hometown. And there was a sign outside of one town I drove by one time. And, you know, and it said home to, you know, 50 great people and two or three not so nice ones. 2016, we had a, a couple of quandaries from the Lord as the Lord was asking us where, you know, uh, where we wanted to serve. As he called us through his church to serve Battle Creek, Nebraska. But he also called us to serve a, a congregation in northwest Indiana. It was a, a suburb of Chicago. And we went to visit there in that congregation. And we got to see their church and their school and the ministry going on there. And my wife and I got to go to our favorite pizza restaurant from Chicago. I hear they're going to put one of those in Omaha, Giordano's Pizza. I'm not sure if that's still going to happen after COVID and everything, but looking forward to it if it does. And we got to go to one of our favorite pizza places, and we got to sit down there in the suburbs of the city, and we got to ask the question of ourselves that God was asking, do you want to serve here as I've called you to serve in this place? And my wife and I both looked at each other and said, we're not city people anymore. We can't raise our family in the city. And so we kind of crossed that one off the list and headed back to Nebraska and ended up in the city after all, just a different size of city. Remember, we lived in a cornfield before. But one of the interesting things that God has provided through all of those paths, through years of of ministry and learning about ministry in Chicago and St. Louis and in cornfield and and in Nebraska is that variety of experiences. And, you know, there's just something about those experiences you get when you, you leave home. And I remember going back to a high school reunion, and there were two groups of people at the high school reunion. There were those people who haven't left town. Some of those people are still living the glory days from high school. The football captain is still the biggest jock and jerk in town. Then there is the group of people who, they've left town, they've traveled the world or they've moved to other states and other communities and we look at them and we say not much has changed has it now some of those people are having an amazing life some of these people are having an amazing life some of these people are really struggling some of these people are really struggling but the biggest difference is perspective Once you see beyond the two miles up the highway, perspective changes. Sometimes 
we think perspective is a bad thing. I want to talk about another perspective problem we have. And it's the problem we're facing right now because the church is under attack. It's not under attack from the outside. I mean, it is, but that's nothing new. For 2,000 plus years, there have been people outside the walls of the church who can't stand Christ or his message or his people, and they really want to silence that proclamation of morality that's going from the church, and they want to, they want to stop the work of the church. They want to stop the ministry of the church and that worldview, and they just don't want anything to do with the church. They don't want the church to have any, any possible influence on their society or their culture, and that's been going on for a long time. You know what? What's happening in 2020 that's new and different is how the church is facing attacks from within on a level and a scale that we haven't seen for a long time. I mean, they've been around before. I remember sitting around my grandparents' dinner table as my parents and grandparents would badmouth our church and our pastor. Why did I get into ministry again? I remember sitting around that table and even sometimes adding my own voice to that conversation. I remember sitting and hearing other conversations where I would really question individuals and their leadership in the church. And even in the last months, I've sat on Zoom calls and I've listened to other pastors talk about ministry and I thought to myself, you're crazy. And they've said the same thing to me. And dear friends in Christ, this challenge for what should we be doing as church? How do we respond when uh, all of our values, all the things we treasure, all the things we hold sacred are being questioned and it seems like they're being taken away from us? And with that feeling of a lack and a loss of control, we just let our sin start showing. And that's the way 2020 has been. We don't have a whole lot of happiness, a whole lot of joy, a, a whole lot of contentment. We don't have a whole lot of positive things to say right now. As we think about celebrating Christmas, it doesn't even feel like it's Christmas. Sure, it seems like 10 times more people have put lights on their houses, but it doesn't seem like there's much celebrating to do. It doesn't seem like we should be talking about a pink candle of joy. It really feels like we should stick with the purple of repentance and feeling bad and feeling terrible. It's like we should have decorations. We should have tears on our tree because we're not going to be celebrating like we always do. It just doesn't seem fitting to have Christmas yet. Can we put it off some? Can we delay it until you know, things are a little better? Because it just does not feel like there's any joy in this joy to the world time. Does it? Do you feel the same joy you usually feel middle of December? Or is this year's Christmas celebration really as dark and joyless as it's starting to feel. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Thessalonian Christians in our reading today, starts off our reading here this way, rejoice always. Rejoice always. Really, Paul? Really? Rejoice always? What about if we can't get together with our family and I may never see my grandparents at Christmas again? Rejoice then? What if it's a, you know, Christmas, this Christmas we get cancer for Christmas? Rejoice then? What if we've just had our fourth COVID death in the congregation? Rejoice then? What if every board or council meeting, there's another angry voice screaming and shouting about wearing masks or not wearing a mask? Rejoice then? What about when you lose your job because of COVID cutbacks? Rejoice then? What about when 
the, your wife or your spouse tells you, you know, this just isn't working anymore. Rejoice then? What about when your children make a terrible mistake, a terrible life choice that has long-reaching consequences? Rejoice then? Paul, I think you're crazy. Rejoice always? If only he knew what life would be like a couple thousand years later in Midwest America. Maybe he wouldn't say rejoice always, would he? Would he really write that still? Can we really find joy to the world today? Maybe it's a perspective problem. You see, we don't know truly what it's like to live without a lot of the things that we treasure and find joy in. But if there ever was a time or a group of people who knew what it was like to suffer, who knew what it was like to face the ridicule and tribulation and trial that may come close, no, it doesn't even come close to what we're facing right now, it would be the church of Jerusalem in the first century. The church under James, brother of Jesus, who was their lead pastor. The church that was there at Jerusalem where all of the political leaders and even old religious leaders rejected them. And when Rome finally came in, they destroyed everything. And the church there was scattered to the corners of the world in what is called the Great Dispersion. And I'm going to share with you some words from James chapter 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. He's writing to his church that's not even here as church anymore because of the rejection and ridicule and persecution, because of the dangers and troubles and trials they faced. They can't meet together at all. They are scattered over continents. And James is writing this universal letter out to the church, and he starts it off like this, count it all joy my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Imagine the perspective of James, who's really had his church torn apart, who's really had his life threatened, who has watched friends be executed for their faith, Watch James and his perspective as he calls out to his church, count it joy, brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. You see, the perspective we get from James and his church is a perspective that shows us, it opens our eyes to see that joy is not just the absence of difficulties. Joy is facing those difficulties with confident faith. Joy is facing these days, these troubles, these struggles with eyes that don't look at ourselves, but eyes that look at what Jesus is doing out there. Joy comes from seeing Jesus at work in and among and amidst the things that we are struggling and suffering with. Where do I find joy in ministry? Where do I find joy in the midst of this Christmas in the middle of a pandemic? How can we dare light a pink candle and decorate a tree? Because Jesus is at work. Because Jesus is accomplishing amazing things. Because in the midst of all of these things, nothing, nothing that a crazy pandemic can do, nothing that the uncertainty of an election season can do, nothing that anything else can do can stop the work of Jesus in our midst. And if we could have that perspective, if we could see beyond ourselves, if we could see Jesus moving, 
saving, redeeming. There's joy. There's joy because, as the the hymn for Christmas reminds us, there's no more thorns and thistles. No more so thorns infest the ground. We're reminded that all the curses, all the consequences of sin, all the brokenness is all being removed by Jesus. Excuse me. We see victory. You see, God has given the light of the world in the person of Jesus He has demonstrated that light through the epiphany to the magi and to the Gentiles of the world. And now he has called you and I to be light bearers into the world around us. Instead, we get so easily focused on the darkness and the overwhelming sense of doom and gloom. And yet, here we are, not just the light of a manger and a star, but the light of an empty tomb and the ultimate victory of Jesus, our Christmas message. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Joy to the world. The Lord is come. May the peace of God, which passes all of our understanding, guard our hearts and minds and fill them with joy in Jesus. Amen.
In the prayer of the church this morning, prayers requested on behalf of some family members um, who have passed away in the last week. Uh, prayers for the family of Florence Carson, the mother of Terry Carson. Prayers for the family of John Werner, son of Arlene Werner. And prayers for the family of Kim Meyer, wife of Dave Meyer. As these have been called to their heavenly home, we ask God to bless each of these families with his presence and the peace that passes our understanding. Each of our prayers ends, Lord, in your mercy. Congregation responds, hear our prayer. Please rise. Almighty God, we give thanks to you for all of your goodness. And we praise you for the love that sustains us from day to day. We give you thanks for the gift of your Son, our Savior, through whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, for your holy church and for the means of grace, for the lives of all faithful and just people, and for the hope of the life to come. Help us to treasure in our hearts all that you have done for us. Enable us to show our thankfulness with lives wholly given to your service. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, save and defend your church, which has been purchased with the precious blood of Christ. Strengthen your faithful people through word and sacrament, making us perfect in love and in good works, and establishing in us the faith you once delivered to your saints. Grant your wisdom and grace to all pastors and all those who hold office in your church, that by devoted service, faith may abound and your kingdom increase. Send out the light of your truth into all the earth, and raise up faithful servants of Christ, who will advance the gospel, both here at home and in distant lands. And in your mercy, strengthen newly established congregations, support them in challenging times, make them steadfast, abounding in the work of the Lord. Let their faith and zeal for the gospel refresh and renew the witness of your people everywhere. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, take from us all hatred and prejudice and give us a spirit of love and order our days in your peace. Prosper the labor of those who work to bring peace and justice to the nations, that mutual understanding and common endeavor may be increased among all people. Preserve our nation in justice and honor, that we may lead a peaceful life with integrity. Grant health and favor to all who bear office in our land, especially the President and Congress of the United States, and the Governor and Unicameral of this state, and all those who make, administer, and judge our laws. Help them to serve your people according to your holy will. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, bless the schools of the church and all colleges, universities, and centers of research and all those who teach and work in them. Grant your wisdom in such measure that people may serve you honorably in church and state and that our common life may be conformed to the ways of your truth. Sanctify our homes with your presence and bless them with joy. Keep our children in the covenant of their baptism and enable their parents to bring them up in lives of faith and devotion. Unite the members of all families in a spirit of affection and service that they may show your praise in our land and in all the world. Lord, in your mercy, by your word and spirit, comfort all who are in sorrow or need six or adversity, especially Clee and Sharon, Pastor and Sue Kip, Millie and Randy, Eileen, Colton and Taylor and Karen and Vicki and Ardeth, April, Lisa, Jerry and Mike, all others whose needs we might name before you. Also be with those who suffer persecution for the faith and have mercy on those to whom death draws near. And we ask you to bring consolation to those who are in sorrow, especially the families of Florence and John and Kim. Comfort them with your presence and a reminder of those who have died in the Lord, rest in the Lord. And on the last day, when we stand face to face with you, we are reunited with all the saints. Lord, bring consolation to those in sorrow and grant to all a measure of your love, taking them into your tender care. Lord, in your mercy... All these things, whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we enter into the service of the sacrament, I would have you now take out your communion cups and have those ready. Not quite time to open them yet, but we're going to have those out. And if you'd like to raise your glasses up um, as we have the words of institution at this time. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he gave him thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you to this remembrance of me. And this time we all took the cup after supper. When he gave him thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Now welcome to the table of the Lord. I invite you now to peel the wafer open. And then I invite you to take and eat the body of Christ given unto death for you. Turn the cup over. Peel open the wine. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of all of your sins. May this true body and blood of our Lord strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the one true faith and to life everlasting. Depart in peace with joy. Amen. Congregation may be seated.
Please rise. Let us pray. O light of light and King eternal, we thank you for giving the holy innocent blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, the babe of Bethlehem, to redeem us from the darkness of our sin and set us on the path of righteousness. Sustain our faith in the Savior until that day when night is no more and we rejoice in your presence for eternity. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We're going to remain standing for our final song. We're going to wait a moment, though, for Mr. Whitney to get from the balcony to the priest team area. The zip line was not yet installed for him. We join together in our final song of hope to our Lord today. Be seated. 
And good morning. Words of welcome to each and every one of you here this morning. Pray God has blessed you through our worship today. A few announcements for you uh, this morning. Um, as we leave worship today, you'll see a few members of Light, our youth group out in the narthex there, where uh, our spare change collection as we uh, collect some funds for uh, purchasing gifts for a uh, family of our congregation to help them uh, experience the joy of Jesus this Christmas season. And so if you have some spare change, uh, Light members back there in the back as you leave today, I um, encourage you to just uh, donate some of that spare change for them. And also later on today, of course, we have Education Hour coming up here at 1015. Um, member 7th grade confirmation class is here in the sanctuary again this week. Um, then this afternoon, 1 to 5, is the drive through Nativity um, at DeVette Center. And then tonight at 5 o'clock is our school Christmas concert. And that's uh, all virtual, be online. Premieres at 5 o'clock on the school Facebook page. Um, so uh, you look there on the school Facebook page for that concert. And we'll share it over to the church Facebook page and everywhere else we possibly can. And it'll be available later as well. But, uh, so you don't have to watch it at 5. But hey, join everybody together at 5 and watch it if you're not doing anything else. And so that's going to be uh, tonight, 5 o'clock there. Wednesday night we gather for our midweek worship um, at uh, 6.30. Uh, this Wednesday, of course, we have Bible classes on Tuesday night and Wednesday morning. Don't forget to check those out. You can still join those, even if it's just for the one class you want to be a part of. Um, then next weekend on Sunday morning is our third annual family Christmas worship service. And if you remember this from years gone by, it's an opportunity. We have some, some hands-on things we do in worship um, together in your pew with your family group and um, some tactile ways to try to connect the messages of our worship and then things we take home with us and remember what we've learned in worship that day. And so um, that's next Sunday, 9 o'clock. We'll have songs and we'll have confession, absolution, and we'll have kind of some of those elements of worship will be a part of our service. But um, it's kind of not traditional in a sense. And so if that's not something you're comfortable with, we'd encourage you to join us on Saturday night at 6 p.m. for worship um, instead of Sunday morning. But here's Sunday morning, 9 o'clock, is our family Christmas worship service. And then, of course, reminding you about Christmas Eve services. We have four services on Christmas Eve at 1, 4, 7, and 11. And uh, it is the, the most uh, attended worship service day in our church's calendar year. And so I'm um, trying to spread out attendance. We are asking our members to register their attendance for that day. And so we can try to spread our attendance out and kind of know what to expect. And so at stjohnbc.net, you can go there to the website, click the button for Christmas Eve worship, and just register yourself, uh, your family, however many you're going to be bringing to worship with you, um, and which service you're coming to, so that we can kind of help uh, keep that all spread out at those services. The Christmas Day worship is at 9 a.m., uh, same time as our Sunday morning worship services are. All right. Uh, was there any other announcements that you need to make? Yeah, I want to tell you a quick offering envelopes. Make sure, remember, pick those up in the narthex if you haven't already. And in case you missed the announcement last week, we did um, go through the process to reduce the expense of envelopes because we had a number of envelopes that we didn't need. Um, and, and so um, they were renumbered this year. You know, if uh, you really, 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 really want a number for only a $10,000 donation, we'll get you your number. Um, otherwise, just grab the envelopes and donate whatever you want. Um, if you don't see an envelope for, for you on there, in, in that process, you know, there's always an opportunity or a chance for a, a, a computer mistake, just something to not get punched right in the computer. Don't feel like we didn't want to give you envelopes if you're looking for them. Just ask, give us a call, ask myself, one of your staff members, and we'll see if we can help you um, either locate them or get a, a label printed for envelopes for you um, because of that clerical error. So otherwise, they're down there in the narthex. Make sure you pick those up. I think that is now all the announcements I have to make today. They say the Lord has blessed us with. May you enjoy your family and friends. And um, before we start worship space today, I invite you to spend a few moments in prayer as you ask God to help restore your joy and your perspective for joy this Christmas season. <laughs> 